So the first thing I want to do is say good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. My name is Alan Miller, and I will be hosting this meeting. I'm a member of the program committee that organizes Sunday mornings at the Marxist Library. And I would like to start off by saying <clears throat> that we always welcome input, feedback, suggestions for topics, and speakers. And you can contact us through our website at icss.marx.org. ICSS um, this weekly program of the Institute for Critical Study of Society, ICSS, in pre-pandemic times was hosted at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library located in Oakland, California, USA. During the pandemic and maybe afterwards, we will meet digitally on Zoom, although we still solicit donations to support the work of the Mar Nebel Proctor Marxist Library. In fact, I have to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, because we now have attendees from throughout the US and even around the world. For over a decade and a half, Sundays mornings at the Marxist Library programs, we have been a platform for diverse presentations on topics ranging from political economy, capitalism, socialism, communism, imperialism, politics, militarism, war, from a working class Marxist perspective. We have consciously, and I hope successfully, cultivated a culture of mutual respect and understanding that we do not necessarily agree on all matters. Rather, this is a comradely forum for political discourse and debate. The opinions expressed here are those of the participants they do not represent the ICSS or Marxist library. However, we are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx and we believe that his work remains relevant today. Our motto is taken from Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, quote, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it. Our speaker today, Rajendra Sahai, is someone who lives by this thesis. He's a founding member of ICSS, an ongoing member of our program committee, and has presented in the past on topics as diverse as socialism in the USSR and political and economic develops in India. Today, he will be speaking on the logic of capitalist production and Marx's ecology. A quick note before we begin on how the session will be conducted. Our speaker will have one hour for his presentation, during which time attendees will all be muted. If you need anything, you can always communicate with everyone or anyone using Zoom chat, which you can open by clicking on the chat icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. <clears throat> After the presentation, we'll have a short break for announcements followed by an hour of question and answers moderated by myself. If you have questions or a comment during the Q&A, raise your hand in the participants window by clicking on participants and raising your hand, clicking on that. We will call you in order. You'll have two minutes for your question or comment. Please be respectful to the group, speaker, and the moderator. Finally, at 1230, we will open up for discussion. So with that, I'll turn it over to our speaker, Raj, for today's presentation. Go ahead, Raj. Thank you, Alan. Uh, one correction, I was not the founding member. I joined pretty soon after it was founded. So that's, with, that's the only thing I will just want to correct that I was not the founding member. Um, so back to our session, I would like to share the screen here just so you can see the bullet points of my talk today. And then I'll take it off because uh, I've written it all down. So I'll be reading it uh, because the material is dense and I think will be quite controversial in this group, uh, some parts of it. And so please make notes uh, so that you can comment on it later on as I proceed, but uh, during the presentation, we'll, I'll just carry on uh, assuming that you're taking notes or dis on anything that you want to disagree with. 
So I have six points, introduction, the climate change created situation the world faces today. The third one is logic of capitalist production. The fourth is ecology. Fifth is growth of capital in China and ecology. Socialist vision of society and ecology is the last section with which I close. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and go to my text. So um, the introduction part. In 1922, a Soviet geologist named Alexei Pavlov pr proposed the word Anthropocene or Anthropogene as a name for the epoch since human beings evolved some 160,000 years back. The reasoning was his conclusion that man became a significant factor, man means men and women, in changing of nature that existed before him. But in the West, this was not accepted term until 2000, when Dutch atmospheric chemist, Paul Crutzen, winner of Nobel Prize, I think it was 1995 for his work that showed chemicals used in industry were destroying ozone layers that protected the earth. He yelled at a conference during a paper being read in the conference in Mexico, uh, and he said the term Holocene, which was used uh, by the presenter, Holocene epoch was no longer applicable to our era. We are in Anthropocene era. Holocene epoch started about 11,700 years back with the end of the Ice Age. Barry Commoner uh, wrote in his book, The Closing Circle, published 1971, we know something has gone wrong after World War II. For most of our serious pollution problems either began in post-war years of greatly or greatly worsened since then. Indeed, the intense hostility to the USSR began the rise of the military industrial complex centered around nuclear weapons and delivery systems in the US right after the end of Second World War, in which, as you know, nuclear weapons were used. Ian Angus, author of uh, Facing the Anthropocene, that's the title of the book, calls it the second stage of Anthropocene. Um, Facing the Anthropocene, which is about the period from 1945 to present, was published in 2016. Another book is titled The Return of Nature by John Bellamy Foster, editor of Monthly Review, published uh, last month. These two books, along with my reading of Marx and Engels' writings, in particular Marx's Capital, which I've been reading since 2005, almost nonstop. I'm on the third reading of, of the three volumes of Capital now. Uh, so that formed the substance of what I say, these three things together. Of course, uh, also Engels' writing, as I mentioned. And my own, added to that is my own take on the subject, for which my lived experience in two very different countries, India, where I was raised till I was 21, and the US, where I have more or less resided continuously since that time. Altogether, that gives me an experience that is full of richness of contradictions that life usually is for almost everybody. So <clears throat> the climate change created, uh, there's a second item of the bullet points I told you, the climate change created situation the world faces today. So I'll give you the highlights of it. The planet's average surface temperature has risen about two degrees Fahrenheit since the late 19th century a change driven largely by increased carbon dioxide and other human-made emissions into the atmosphere. 2.05 uh, degree Fahrenheit, which is the number, is roughly equivalent to 1.3 degrees Celsius. Most of the warming occurred in the past 40 years, with the six warmest years on record taking place since 2014. Uh, 2019, 
uh, was the second warmest year on record. NASA, uh, NASA, NASA uh, data shows that average global temperature, temperatures in 2019 were 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the 20th century average. In fact, the five warmest years in 1888 to 2019 record have all occurred since 2015. The ocean has absorbed much of this increased heat with the top 330 feet of ocean showing warming of more than 0 0.6 degree Fahrenheit since 1969. Earth stores uh, roughly 90% of the extra energy it receives in the ocean. Um, the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets have decreased in mass. Data from NASA's gravity recovery and climate experiments show Greenland lost an average of 280 billion tons of ice per year between 1993 and 2019 while Antarctica lost about 148 billion tons of ice per year. If you go to Northern Canada, you can see the, uh, this um, uh, ice um, and you can see how far it has receded. I've been there. So uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere as of May 19, 2020 is is 416 parts per million, which is the highest it has been in human history that scientists know about. 11% of the emissions of global greenhouse gas are caused by humans and are due to, de I mean, that are caused by humans are due to deforestation, comparable to the emissions from all of the passenger vehicles on the planet and forest deforestation is caused by enormous amount of production that uses up that uh, wood. Uh, 1.4 billion heads of cattle worldwide emit methane gas, part of the greenhouse gases, which is more than 10 times what it was 200 years ago. So, you know, this farming, organized farming, etc., that has developed basically in the last 150 years. The species that are going extinct every year are 10,000 fold more than in pre-industrial period. There's a 16 fold increase in use of energy that happened in the 20th century, which has increased sulfur dioxide to twice the natural levels in the atmosphere. Roughly 45% of global population is currently impacted by land degradation worldwide. Most of them are poor from working classes. 800 million people, that is 11% of world's population is currently vulnerable to climate change impacts such as droughts, floods, heat waves, extreme weather events, and sea level rise. These people in vast majority live in poorer countries of the South. India is one of them. Uh, 800,000 hectares of mangroves are lost every year. At this rate, the mangroves may disappear within the next century. This loss removes an important buffer from extreme weather for coastal communities and releases immense amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And as we know, those of us who live in, in the state of California, wildfires have grown more intense I moved here uh, 50 years back, almost 50 years back, 1971. And so it's in my lived experience. And so have the storms in Southeastern states and uh, what is known as hurricanes and uh, typhoons in Asia have higher intensity affecting many countries. So the third, a bullet point of my talk is the logic of capitalist production because ecology and capitalist production, the degradation of ecology and capitalist production are interlinked. 
Global production of commodities under industrial capitalism took a very significant boost with machinery and automation. We all know that. Much of it came in the 19th century onwards, though it started in the 18th century. The logic of capitalist production requires a minimum rate of profit for individual businesses to be viable competing in the market, which is 10%. I ran a business, I never made 10%. You know, I, I ran a, a consulting engineering practice, a small one. Uh, so 10% on the average was not possible. In our industry, it was 7%, and I was below that. But the surplus rate has to be much greater, even for 10%, uh, as profit for individual business is only a part of the surplus generated in the business. Monopolies and big businesses eat from the surplus. Banks, insurance, landlords, those other people. Thus, the surplus rate has to be well above, in my judgment, 15%, more like 17 to 20 percent range. It's it's that that's the rate at which uh, capitalism is running, quote unquote, in a healthy way. Everybody's happy. I mean, the cap capitalist class is happy. Workers are employed, so workers are not a problem for them as much. So, um, but that's that's what you need to make about uh, some seven or eight percent more than the minimum 10 percent that an individual business needs. Now, giant monopolies control or try to control the markets assisted by their national governments. And even an alliance of many countries' governments is formed for this. One example today is, is, uh, is the Huawei uh, uh, of China, a monopoly itself, which threatens Western monopolies, which are competing with it, so the old imperialist countries, which are banding together to, to block its reach. And that's what happens when a new entrant comes in as China has come in with big capital itself. Capital continuously expands, okay? That's its nature because workers get paid in wages only a part of the labor they perform. And this constantly enlarging capital cannot remain dormant because if it remains dormant, then it brings down the rate of profit for the system as a whole and creates an economic crisis. So it must expand productions relentlessly. Now, <laughs> this is the logic of cancer, growth for the sake of growth. Uh, investment of capital is both in consumer sector, which serves the consumption needs of both workers and capitalists by producing subsistence for all uh, of all the goods for the working class as well as for the capitalists and luxury goods for the wealthy. So both are consumer, called consumer goods. And then the other sector is machine making sector, which is consumed by businesses among themselves employing the machinery. So one manufacturer of machinery, uh, for example, a tractor maker will sell it to a agricultural capitalist who uses them to create commodities for consumption of both workers and, and capitalists. So when, <clears throat> but once again, profit rate is the master of this whole thing in capitalism, which is a system we have now globally. But this process runs into what is known as overproduction of capital. Now, uh, and, and uh, overproduction, and that is the economic, causes economic crisis. So now uh, most of us who have read capital, many of us in this group, I know that capital exists in three forms, money in the bank as capital, and uh, also in the shop where the production is taking place that I call production capital, and then as commodities called in the circulation. So there are three forms. And when, whenever uh, the stagnation comes, it affects all three. Now, our workers' money in the bank is not capital for the worker, but it is for those who use it as capital. Money stagnates in financial institutions and commodities in this scenario. Sales stagnates, production stalls. That is why there are periodic recessions and when exceptionally large and longer term, these are called depressions like the ones in 1930s. The one 2008 and nine was not called depression because it didn't last 
from a capitalist viewpoint long enough, from a worker's viewpoint, uh, it is still going on. So maybe it, that's why they call it the K, K type recovery. Recovery for the upper half, uh, the upper section, it's not half, it's only about a quarter of the people who, for whom the recovery happened and two thirds didn't have the recovery and the bottom half really actually really stagnated. To restore the economic system, capital gets destroyed periodically by peaceful, uh, what you call peaceful means such as businesses uh, who cannot compete go bankrupt and have to sell it, its means of production for a fraction of its value. And, and, and that happens. Uh, and then the other is by violent destruction, as when it happened in World War I and World War II, and also in smaller wars. Uh, but the World War I and II were the major destruction of capital. Once that destruction play takes place, capital become quote unquote healthy. It's of course not healthy <laughs> for us, the people who are living under its dominance. Okay. But it can begin to get a rate of return, which is what happened in 1945, because enough capital was destroyed. So to end this anarchy of capital, socialist revolutions in Russia and China overthrew capitalism. But these could not be sustained in the forms consistent with the goals of socialism. So we are back in an era of capital dominance again since about 1990. We'll say goals of socialism means workers control production for basically they use, uh, they create use values basically for the society as a whole, not for making profit. That's basically would be the way to say a goal of socialism. But now capitalism once again has been in crisis. Um, so capitalist commodity, and it has been in crisis since 1980s. Capitalist commodity production relations are much more expanded now, unlike 100 years ago in times of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, um, which was about 150 years ago. Uh, it literally covers now in almost the entire globe. If it's not 100%, it's 95 to 98%. Uh, it includes China now, you know, which is, and Russia, which is now second largest commodity producer and probably also second or first consumer of commodities in the world, probably second. Since the coming, we are number one, you know, in the United States people like to be number one, we are number one. Since the coming of nuclear weapons, wars between those who have this arsenal are too risky. So only small countries that are in the way of access to exploit the earth's uh, riches, which is, comes in forms of uh, raw materials or human labor, you know, uh, both of them, uh, when they get in the way that they, a powerful country will go and destroy them, capitalist country, uh, because they have superior weapons. Uh, Nixon opened China in 1970 to solve the economic crisis of moribund capital as well as for strategic reasons. Now, moribund capital is the capital as I described when, when the profit rate is actually going down and they've got commodities, you've got a stagnant economy. So, but there was also another related strategic reason to increase pressure on the USSR, isolating the USSR as the other socialist state. China was socialist and USSR was socialist and, and several other countries, North Korea, war, war was going on in Vietnam, uh, Cuba had become a socialist country by that time, so on and so forth. And there was an anti-imperialist revolt all over the world. Uh, India had gained independence in 1947. Anyway, so Nixon opened China. Uh, to increase pressure. So this, this was also related to, because by increasing pressure, destroying a rival economic system, capitalism was to benefit, at least for some time. And that's what happened. Now, <clears throat> what happened in Tiananmen, a uh, tragic episode of June, 1989, is where this crushing of the Chinese workers' revolt against capitalist opening established 
firm capitalism firmly in China. Okay, I know many people here will not agree with me on that. Uh, we can discuss it. Those who are unfamiliar uh, with it, I refer them to William Hinton's eyewitness account in his book titled The Great Reversal. The last chapter is on the so-called Tiananmen confrontation. Uh, I'm not talking about the students who were bourgeois, but the workers who were uh, about 3 million workers were activated in opposition to it. They were crushed. Okay, the reversal in China, however, did not lead to capitalist control the state. Now that's, that's what makes China unique, which the West had hoped for and anticipated. Communist party maintained firm control, uh, political control. And further, in the agreement with foreign capital to be invested in China, and, not, and mind you, the West was desperate also because they had economic crisis. So China had some leverage with that. Leaders of China insisted on transfer of technology, very smart. So China as a country benefited, but workers as a class lost worldwide. And this is where the break between USSR and China is a crucial thing, negative development for socialism's future, or at least the 20th century socialism's uh, so uh, <clears throat> the workers globally, including Chinese workers, in my opinion, uh, lost because as a class, they gave in to capitalism, uh, which, is, which is their enemy. It can never be its friend, even if it's managed by a communist party. Um, in the New Deal programs enacted in 1930s here in, in the US, workers had traded jobs and better wages for political power. Well, that, was a, that was a devil's deal they had made. But unlike in the US, China, the party representing the workers itself changed the system. Okay, but it's not completely changed. So China is unique and I admit that China is not an ordinary kind of uh, capitalist state. In the US, it was also the same except the party was dissolved by Yeltsin. So that was a complete. And then what came after that is also a different case under, under Putin. So that also is a peculiar case. So while foreign capitalists made huge profits from the cheap labor in China, Chinese domestic capital at first, um, uh, it was municipal and provincial governments organizing collective production based on capital. Later, they also allowed under reform private capital to grow. And along with that, the technology that China gained, capitalist development took off well managed by the Communist Party of China, controlled, and China became a second most powerful, economically powerful country by now. So now my, I'll go to my fourth bullet points, which is ecology, and is a subject of uh, part of our discussion today. The bourgeois, bourgeois definition of ecology is that it is the biology and economy of nature. This definition is reductionist and mechanistic, suitable for the exploitative system of capital. Biology, okay, so it recognizes that uh, the whole thing is an organism and then economy of nature, you know, I, you know this, this whole thing is again, like many concepts of the bourgeoisie, it's short full of nonsense. Uh, the, I mean, partly true also, I'm not saying there's never a, a iota of truth. The word ecology was coined in 1866 by Ernst Haeckel. He was a German philosopher and a biologist. He promoted Darwin. He was a follower of Darwin. He did significant work on species classification, but then he went further to social Darwinism. Harvard paleontologist Stephen J. Gould, whom many of you, uh, about whose work you, many of you know, called it Haeckel's evolutionary racism. Haeckel's call uh, to the German people for racial purity and unflinching devotion to a just state, just state. And here Haeckel should get this dubious credit for this also, because he's the one who promoted the state as the civilizing agency. You know, if you read Hegel, if you read critique of uh, uh, Hegel's philosophy of right by Marx, what Hegel is saying is 
what gives us freedom is the state by, by civilizing the society, the rules, and, and that's how you become free person. Well, uh, Marxist <laughs> thing for Marx and Lenin, state is an agency which works on behalf of the dominant class of society. And it's a representation of contradiction of classes. So if there are no classes, if there are only one class remaining, everybody works, you will no, no longer need the state. Okay, and in uh, pre pre uh, feudal societies, that was pretty much the same. The state didn't really exist. Haeckel's believe in that harsh unyielding laws of evolution. So he believed in Darwin. So he believed in evolution, and he, but he applied. He said that this ruled human civilization and nature alike. He applied it to human civilization, conferring upon favored races the right to dominate others. Okay, now this is what gave birth to Nazism, and that's why the fascism of Germany was different. Mr. Haeckel was the chief uh, guy. The religious view of nature saw a divine entity controlling it. Now, this is a religious view of nature. Ancient philosophers of India called the entire universe a family. That was an idealist conception. Christianity placed uh, it all in God's hand. So they, they didn't even go that far. Epicurus, the Greek philosopher of around 300 BC, you know, saw nature in materialist terms, as far as we know. He's part of what is known as Greek atomists. He was the first to do so. As you probably know, Marx's doctoral thesis was a study comparing philosophy of Democritus, which is around 450 BC uh, Greece, and Epicurus, uh, 300 BC both Greek philosophers. Um, and that's where the term democracy comes from, Democritus. He was the ruler of, I think it was the king. So ecology studies interaction of species with each other and with their environment, interaction in which one of the species is humans. And that species has the greatest impact on their environment. Okay, so this is more along materials definition of ecology under uh, and, and not a mechanistic and reductionist type. Under capitalism, this impact has become very injurious to environment from the beginning of the 19th century. That is when the industrial capitalism really took hold in England and much more after 1945 as Anthropocene phase, you know, second phase of Anthropocene start from it in 1945, according to Ian Angus. So <clears throat> Engels, now we're talking about Engels. Engels' introduction to the issue of ecology came from the environment of workers in English factories and their settlements. And that happened because he met Barry Burns in Manchester, where his father's firm, along with his partners, was located. And with Mary Burns, he met both were about the same age. She was a one year old, younger to him, uh, one or two years, uh, whom he met and they fell in love. And this is the beautiful thing about being young. You fall in love, there are all kinds of things you can go over. Of course, Engels was already uh, fighting for, for those who were poor working people. Uh, so he, when he came to England, so that's, uh, he was there for apprenticeship in his father's uh, business. It is when he wrote The Condition of the Working Class of England, which was published two years later in 1945. On wealth, I want to, because you know, we've, with comrades here and friends here, we have discussed what is wealth. So let me quote you from Marx, what Marx says about what is wealth. So Marx says, what is wealth? If not individuals' needs, capacities, enjoyments, and productive powers, etc produced in the course of universal exchange. All right, sufficient leisure time is part of enjoyments of life. I think all of you will agree with me. So it is part of person's wealth in my opinion, but capitalism robs the workers of his many needs, his powers, his capacities, and even his productive powers. And certainly most of his leisure time by making him an appendage of the uh, to the machine. The embodiment, which is the embodiment of capital, 
Machinery is the, in the capitalist era is the embodiment of capital. It need not be in a socialist uh, era. Judging, so workers do not get wealthy under capitalism. They may have higher wage, but they don't get wealthy, but rather get, rather get robbed. So <clears throat> judging workers rising wages in the system of capitalism, therefore, in my opinion, is accepting the ideology of capital. We shouldn't accept it as Marxist. Another quote from Marx, human sensuousness is embodied time. The existing reflection of the sensuous word, word in itself. In a human, be, in a human being hearing, nature hears itself. In smelling, it smells itself. In seeing, it sees itself, end of quote. So this is Marx's quotation, right, about, about nature. The materialist dialectic in this view was based on the physical material human being, corporeal human being, who as an objective sensuous being constituted a part of nature, able to know natural conditions and processes through his interaction with nature, as well as collectively theirs through their specifically productive role as conscious, embodiments of nature engaged in labor, transforming the world around them for their own continued experience, uh, existence, sorry, existence, continued existence, and in the process, changing themselves. Unlike animals, human beings cannot adopt to even to the degree the animals can. They can grow first in cold climate. I mean, they do change some, but I mean, Eskimos live in, uh, in uh, in those uh, ice uh, homes that we create because outside is even colder. So there's adaptation, but it's limited. But the important thing is the human beings evolved and Engels made a major contribution on that evolution question also. Anyway, I won't go there. For Marx, the labor process itself, he argued uh, <clears throat> in 1850s, uh, was to be defined as the metabolism of humanity with nature. <clears throat> so that's the labor process. His concern over the robbing of the soil and the loss of soil nutrients, the resulting pollution in the cities and nutritive shortages in the diets of the working population, the squandering of raw materials. Now about diets, let me tell you, about 40% of global uh, food production is actually dumped wasted and how many people are starving or near starvation or nutritionally deficient? Probably I, if I were to guess at least 2 billion out of 7.2 are in that state, or certainly 1 billion. Anyway, so <clears throat> uh, there's the squandering of raw materials, which, which I just gave you an example of deforestation, which I mentioned and uh, desertification and the exigencies of the for food trade, which is also what, when I said food is wasted, all of this led Marx to develop his theory of metabolic rift, okay? Focusing initially on the destruction of soil metabolism associated with industrialized capitalist agriculture. And here he was helped by Liebig's agricultural chemistry with his critique of the ecological robbery system. That's how Liebig put it. So for Engels, uh, the natural world was in a process of constant transformation. And therefore, so were our ideas of the physical world, which would never achieve completeness or take final form because that would mean that evolu evolutionary change itself would have ceased. Quote, I'm quoting uh, uh, Engels, dialectics comprehends things and their representation representations, ideas in their essential connection, mutual interdependence, motion, origin, and ending. Such processes, natural processes, as those mentioned above, are therefore so many corroborations of its own, that is nature's method of, of procedure. Nature is proof of dialectics, end of quote. This is all from, from uh, Engels. 
from his uh, Dialectics of Angles, which di Dialectics of Nature, which he wrote, but, uh, but remained unpublished because he got into, after Marx's sudden death in 83, 1883, he thought it was more important to publish his notes that volume two and three were only available in notes. So he got into that, he never completed that. Uh, but part of it appears in, in anti Dury. Such processes, uh, so I mentioned that, sorry. When united with materialism, so this, this is dialectic, when united with materialism, because he was a materialist, uh, such a perspective necessarily led towards an interconnected ecological worldview. So that's where the definition of ecology is different for us Marxists than that of the bourgeoisie. To quote Engels, Freeman does not consist in any dreamt of independence from natural laws. This is a quotation from Engels. And hence, uh, the conquest of nature, but in the knowledge, uh, uh, now again, the continuation of his quote, but in the knowledge of these laws and the possibility this gives of systematically making them work towards definite ends. So human beings do uh, work with nature, alter it, but they have to basically stay within, remain within the uh, nature's laws as a whole. And this is, and it was this that had to Engels creative capitalism trans transgression of nature's laws and the resulting ecological destruction that follows. So <clears throat> epidemics and pandemics and are disharmony in nature, okay? And the relation between human beings and external nature, that this is a disharmony uh, that was blindly accumulated by society in the very process of commercial accumula accumulation, uh, generating, and I, here I'm quoting from Ray Lancaster, a scientist in the early 20th century and a follower of Marx, who met Marx also, uh, called Nature's Revenges. Uh, through his greedy efforts to produce large quantities of animals and plants, and this is not individual greed, this is capitalism as a system of greed, has accumulated nat unnatural swarms of one species in field and ranch and unnatural crowds of his own kind in towns and fortresses. This is a quotation from Ray Lancaster. Monocultures and urban congestion associated with capitalist development created grounds for the spread of epidemics. This is, this is uh, Foster's uh, conclusion from there. So now, you know that we're one consequence of monoculture, I'll go back and we'll come back to the second example, is, uh, is the farming that produced social disharmony in, in, in mine and many of your lived experience, that was the Khalistan separatist movement in Punjab province of India during the 1980s. India was deficient in grains by 1960s due to rapid rise of population. Why did population rise rapidly? Because the Nehru government, which was the first prime minister of India, had introduced public health. My eldest brother actually worked for that public health. So I went around with him when he went from village to village using DDT because that DDT was supplied by United Nations to eliminate malaria along with the mosquitoes. And I got exposed to DDT, big time. <laughs> I went with him because I was curious. I was a kid. <clears throat> I was in, I think I was just entering college at that point. So um, uh, what happened was that this, this public health uh, at first uh, basically reduced mortality rate because now it's introduced. The British didn't have it. They had civil hospitals in major towns to take care of themselves and the elite of Indian society, okay, the bourgeois, the rising bourgeoisie and the feudal elite. But everybody else was left to their own devices, okay? <clears throat> I mean, they use old Indian Ayurveda and other things, but modern science, uh, Western science was not, medical science was not available to them through certainly no public health, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so, so when they introduced this public health, the effect was drop in, mortality rate among kids, new births. And uh, that suddenly gave a boost to the uh, population and, and that population had to be fed. So now all of a sudden there is a dearth of food grains. 
So um, desperate to solve the food problem, Indian government gave in to the US pressure. Mrs. Gandhi was the prime minister after Nehru's death at that time to use the miracle seeds. Now these were called quote unquote miracle seeds developed in the Ford Foundation backed research that developed a high yielding wheat, which required a lot of water, chemical fertilizers and insecticide, three things, okay. Uh, great for the corporate agribusiness profits, but it led to, and it did increase the yields tremendously in Punjab. This again, this happened, this experiment was done in Punjab from where the farmers are now protesting. And then after a while, the, the, the crop um, size dropped due to salination and water loss. And um, so what happened was that those farmers who grew rich fast uh, and were larger farms, farm holders, and then when the salination occurred, they, they began to buy land from the poor farmers because poor farmers could compete, they have lower prices of farm goods. So they were forced to sell, a lot of dissatisfaction. And that's from where, this is the economic backdrop from where uh, the Khalistan movement came and a lot of people died before it was over. And that included Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated by her own two Sikh bodyguards who were there protecting her for a long time. So, <clears throat> so that's one disharmony you can see. As you can say, we're also in presently experiencing one of the consequences of this big disharmony with nature in the intensifying COVID pandemic, you know, uh, that has already taken over 1.5 million lives worldwide and uh, close to a quarter million lives in the United States alone. And uh, its victims are largely from the least paid of the working class or those who are very old, least paid and those who have to actually physically manually work, cannot work on the computers like, like ourselves who are on the computer right now. And uh, the other section, large section, almost 40% are those in the nursing homes because they cannot live at their, in their homes due to poverty. I mean, they don't have enough money to live in their own homes in old age. Who are these people? These are working people. Again, <clears throat> so, so this is, an, uh, David Ewing had told me when it started rise, that's a good thing. It'll kill all the rich people too. <laughs> so, <laughs> and now you know, uh, that's not the case. Uh, Mr. Trump came out okay because he got the best care. Anyway, capitalism creates fear, insecurity, instability in the lives of workers. That's what it does. Robs workers of her powers, these are her powers, and among the very poor, then birth rate go up as a result. I mean, the poverty is what breeds. Poverty results in birth rate going up. That's what happened to China and India, why the population became so much larger that it sells them cheap commodities by extending credit, forcing them to become more and more subservient to the system. So that's what the present thing is. So there's no redemption for mass majority in the system of capitalism. Okay, neoliberalism is the current phase of capitalism associated with the term consumerism. Neoliberalism and consumerism are go hand in hand which began approximately 40 years back as a global phenomenon. Now that's what distinguishes it. It's a global phenomenon. Because consumerism was here when I came here, when I came in 1966 to the United States from India, consumerism was very much a part of it. But it was much more modest than what a phenomenon it is today. Capital accumulated since 1945, end of World War II. As I mentioned, there was a crisis, found an outlet, and largest of this section went to China. China became a giant workshop. We all know that. Supplying mainly consumer commodities to the world market, mostly cheaper goods. Uh, and it was cheaper than anyone else could uh, based on low edges and automated factories with little regard to pollution, heavy pollution in China. Today we buy cheap commodities shipped from China, Vietnam, Bangladesh, et cetera, packaged with materials that themselves are polluting, also from India, by the way. Um, <clears throat> so uh, these uh, packaging material themselves are petrochemical products 
that are difficult for nature to degrade or at least take a long time. And these commodities have, most of these commodities have short life, okay? So the cycle repeats itself. And that adds to the burden on the ecology of the planet. So I go to the fifth point and I've got, uh, uh, I, I think I'll take 10 minutes to finish. So 10 or 12 minutes. Growth of capital in China and ecology. So today the working people of the world are caught in a double jeopardy. On one hand, capitalism is reducing workers organized bargaining power by production shifted to lowest wage countries, pitting workers in one country against another. This is what started happening. Uh, and the big thing came with China in uh, 1989. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and the capitalist production is rapidly consuming uh, resources of the planet provided by nature while massively polluting land, water, and air. Okay, now some new um, raw materials are also generated by nature, but the process is relatively slow, uh, uh, but largely it is a, it's a depletion. Since the fall of the USS, China has been touted as a successful, successful model of socialism by Chinese government by using the capitalist market, or what is termed as market socialism. In China, the workers are subject to hukou laws, work, which means they don't get benefits outside of where they are, where they're born and you know, grew up. They, they go to cities, but they don't get the benefits there. Work, they work average of 46 hours a week, and that's not for the all workers, the, the high-tech workers are working more like 70 hours a week. Uh, and they work for a capitalist, generally speaking. Except that uh, since their wages are, were so low to begin with, and since the production uses machinery, their wages have risen, consistently risen over time. So Chinese workers are accepting this change now, though they did not initially, as I said, in Tiananmen Square was not just a student thing. So this led to at least half the workers in the US start to go downhill their, their small towns, particularly in the Midwest, uh, became uh, ghost towns in many cases, uh, de degenerated. And, uh, and they don't have any system, hope in the system. Unlike the 1930s when they saw hope after the revolution, the USSR, which is what made uh, the capitalist class here yield to the New Deal, okay? Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's one of the reasons why uh, the U.S. workers uh, fell for an appeal from, from the right-wing populist Trump. Uh, a sufficient number of workers fell for that so that he was elected. And he would have been elected, but for the COVID situation, I think he would have been re-elected re easily. So, uh, so uh, but Biden is a new liberal centrist. We'll see what he does, hardly any hope from him. Uh, similar thing happened in India, majority workers followed Modi, you know, the Hindu nationalist. And now he's facing workers and farmers who are challenging. Okay, in the defeat of Trump, uh, you know, the three sections, one is left that was organized by Sanders movement, another blacks led by Democratic Party, black leaders, and then women uh, who were threatened by the right wing on their reproductive rights have played a role, even if not organized under a communist party to defeat the right wing populism for now. But if Biden fails to solve the problems the mass of workers facing, then return of Trump or another Trump-like figure will, will happen four years from now. Okay, so I think I'm just about getting close to it, uh, finishing uh, just a little bit more. So the, <clears throat> the, as, uh, now the capital economy, as you know, it requires endless ex expansion, which runs into a roadblock of overproduction, right? And, uh, um, and it uses a lot of Earth's resources. And then there's a lot of waste and, and pollution. So um, the current phase of uh, uh, 
called neoliberalism was already showing profit share in the global capitalist economy were declining even before the pandemic. So uh, uh, Andrew Kleiman and Michael Roberts are two economists who studied it. And they say that now the profit rate globally of, of capital is around 10%, uh, which is very low. And, and whereas it was already close to 20% after nine, right after 1945. Um, now, uh, Michael Roberts has also calculated the economic impact of COVID pandemic. Uh, COVID lockdowns have uh, affected 93% of the world's economies, according to him, whereas in the Great Depression was only 82% of the economies of the world. The social cost of pandemic, one weak exception in the depression was the USSR, which was growing very strongly. The social cost of pandemic in the US is estimated by Michael Roberts to be nearly 75% of GDP so far. Okay, similar, you know, it's around $15 trillion. Uh, according to him, COVID pandemic is not an accident, but a logical outcome of the capitalist intense exploitation of nature and manpower. And I sort of feel the same way. Anyway, that brings me to the last point. And if you give me five minutes, I'll finish it. Uh, socialist vision of society and ecology. That's my last section. In 1883, same year that saw Marx's death when he joined uh, this guy, William Morris joined Hinman's Socialist Democratic Federation. He was the most renowned artist and poet in England. He was born to affluence. He's the son of a well-to-do London broker who had grown rich shortly before his death, 1847, I guess that trying to run like hell killed him. In all of his varied artistic and political endeavors, Morris drew inspiration from British romantic movement of early 20th century. Morris thought that in his time, production for genuine use value in England. He was also a Marxist, by the way, follower of Marx and met Marx in his lifetime. Um, is, uh, you know, he thought that uh, genuine use value in England, which was the workshop of the world, just like China is today, uh, <clears throat> would be one quarter of all that was produced. That would be sufficient. The rest was is just a waste. This is his opinion. Um, now, I had a similar, similar assessment in 1960s when I first came here, uh, and I saw the wasteful production and consumption in the United States is really very sharp when you come from India, especially India of 1960. There's a lot of that going on in India now, not a lot, but compared to the United States, but compared to my time. But in 2020, perhaps all the genuinely useful products uh, would be probably be much less than that, uh, a quarter, or maybe at the most quarter. So, you know, if, if you didn't produce three quarters, the impact on the environment will reduce, right? So, uh, so that would begin to he uh, heal the rift with nature. That's one thing. But our, one of my major points of this talk is uh, why I'm speaking here today is that I think we have to have vision of socialism that cannot be the same as in a capitalist society for middle layer. See, the, usually capitalist society has this vision that you will go into the middle class and have a middle class life, right? That's, that's an American dream. Uh, <clears throat> now, I, 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 I assert, this is my assertion, that is the vision of the Chinese leaders. They say by their goal is to make China uh, to be a moderately wealthy society by 2050. They do not say they will make the workers of China uh, a, a, a people who are comfortable and it will be working class. But they say, well, it's a moderate wealthy because what society they are creating is, is a class society. In fact, didn't exist uh, under Mao's China, but under Deng's China, it started. So um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, <clears throat> uh, our, our vision of uh, should be uh, what Marx described in what is called the wealth, right? And it has to be unalienated production for genuine use values in, in society. Uh, workers and those who 
are not yet workers, children, for example, who have to develop their faculties before they become fully, I mean, they may be doing some work as children, uh, as Norma likes them to do, uh, to learn what adulthood is like. Uh, and I think that's fine. But I mean, what I'm saying is that I know people who are in old age who are limited, they can still do some work, but much of the work is done by uh, 20 to 60 age. And this was more or less the vision of Lenin and Stalin in the USSR. And that's how the, the economy was set up, unfortunately. And also Mao tried to do the same thing until 1970 when he caved in to the pressures and China changed afterwards with Deng's leadership. So uh, the last point is that I think Cuba offers us a vision of socialism that is closer to real socialism that is sustainable in a healthy metabolic with nature. It has shown international solidarity with workers and oppressed nations, for example, Angola, Venezuela, and other Latin American countries, and uh, provided health services worldwide. You know, of course, you, you know, in their health services to the worldwide, Cuban doctors went to the mountains of Kashmir on Pakistan side when there was a big earthquake. And their own government didn't send anybody. It was the Cuban doctors treating people who were injured and who were suffering from disease and all that in the cold weather. And the Cuban, Cuban themselves live in a hot climate. Okay, and it came out in their paper, the most prestigious paper is Dawn. And there, it, an article came out saying, what, what, look at our government, look at these Cuban doctors. And, and Dawn is a bourgeois paper, okay. Uh, so now the question is until that revolution, because what do you do in the meantime? I mean, revolution is not tomorrow, I assume. Uh, <clears throat> I wish it was, but uh, uh, what do you do in the meantime? So until the mass movement to overthrow capitalism happens, there still needs to be a movement to pressure the government to enact laws to reduce the dangers of climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emission, conserving energy, use of appropriate technology about which uh, Sandeep and uh, Sharat spoke in, in this forum, replacing fossil fuel technology. But in the end, what will be needed, in fact, will be uh, will happen eventually. This is my assessment and faith, maybe, will be the overthrow of capital, uh, capitalism, towards which we should work. And this talk is discussion today is devoted to that, however insignificant it may be. So I uh, thank you for your attention. And I hope I have not taken much more than time that I thought I would take. So thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to turn it over to Jean, who is going to take, we're going to take a short break, talk about upcoming programs, news from uh, for Sunday morning at the Marxist Library, and uh, a short uh, fundraising pitch. So Jean, do you want to uh, go ahead and... Uh, Okay, and I gather I'm live. You're okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm okay. Well, I'm, I'm alive anyway. Um, okay, well, uh, thank you very much, Raj. That was, as expected, a very provocative uh, uh, discussion you've given us. And um, I'm sure we'll have a very good uh, discussion today. Uh, but we have more uh, good things coming up. Um, next week, we have our comrade Grover Fur coming back. Um, um, and his topic will be Grover Speaks, uh, Trotsky was a collaborator and terrorist, and what this means for us today. So as usual, he uh, will give us a very provocative discussion, and that will be next week. Uh, the following week, uh, we have our comrade from India, uh, Abhinav Shinha. Um, we'll be talking, we're not exactly clear what he's going to be talking, but it'll be given, uh, hopefully he will talk about what's going on with the uh, general strike there. Uh, following that, uh, Kambi Shahai, who is one of the founders of our institute, will be speaking on um, probably uh, freedom and democracy. So that should be uh, very provocative and thought provoking as well. So um, that's what we have coming up. Um, and uh, I'll turn it over to Richard uh, to talk about our finances.
Well, uh, thank you, uh, Jean. Um, our, our, our finances are, uh, we continue to need funds for, uh, for our work and for the library to continue to work. Um, so we're asking people who, who would normally be giving uh, cash donations at the library to send them to, to us. Um, I've posted some information on the chat at the beginning of the chat about how you can do it either through PayPal or through the conventional method using the US mail or the, the, the international mail. Um, so I would urge people to do that. And if people have some suggestions on other ways we can um, receive money uh, easily, um, please let me know and we'll look into um, using them. So please, please uh, donate. Thank you. Great. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to shift over to the Q&A part of the session. And um, I, I want to encourage everybody to uh, chime in with your questions, comments, uh, try and get some lively discussion going here. The way to do that is to go to the participants window, which you can get to by clicking on the participants icon at the bottom of your Zoom window, and then raising your hand. If you hover over your name with your mouse pointer, you can raise your hand and I will call on people. You will unmute yourself and ask your question. You'll have two minutes to ask your question, make a comment. And um, people should not hesitate to ask whatever you wanna ask or to say whatever you wanna say. There's nothing uh, here in terms of being experts or, or uh, anything like that. We just wanna encourage people to say what you're thinking, ask what you're curious about and to feel comfortable uh, chiming into the discussion. So um, why don't we uh, uh, go ahead. So please go ahead and uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. Sharon, go ahead. I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> <laughs> You're being volunteered. Um, well, thank you, Raj. It was very far-ranging um, and provocative. Um, I was struck by your phraseology. When you talked about the changed relationship between the United States and China that was begun in 1970, you said that Nixon opened China. Well, it took two, right? The Chinese decided that they wanted to do that. And they wanted a change relationship with the United States. And um, you, you said that the purpose from Nixon's point of view was to solve the problem to, to contribute to solving the problem of a stagnant economy and to increase the pressure on the USSR. And I don't deny that that's true, but we should also look at it from the point of view of the Chinese. So they, and I am not an expert on this, but it's my understanding that they decided that in order to continue to pursue, pursue their goal of development of the Chinese economy, that they needed Western capital and that they need, needed um, to invite Western capital in to invest. And um, that's what they did. Um, and also they wanted to pursue a detente with the United States um, in terms of the global um, tensions and the possibility of war. So 
I think we need to be clear about the different motivations and then, and then look at what happened after that. Um, and yes, it's true that a part of the United States became a rust belt because production was much less, became much less in those places. It's often said even by so-called progressive people that our jobs went to China. And I hate that expression and I never use it. I, when, I talk, when I talk about, you know, like Bernie's program of bringing jobs back, that kind of thing, um, I think that we need to take the, the, the viewpoint of the international working class. From the point of view of the international working class, a job for a Chinese worker is as important as a job for an American worker and all the people in between. And so I think we need to, and the reason I say that, the main reason I say that is I think we need to combat the nationalist, um, right wing nationalist point of view which says that jobs for us in this country, for working people in this country are the most important. And that's, and that's what we as workers need to fight for, is jobs for us. That's wrong, that's nationalist, that's, that's reactionary. And unless we are explicit <coughs> in our opposition to that, we're doing a disservice to the working class. Raj, you want to uh, comment? And if anybody wants, has any questions, now is a good time to uh, raise your hand from the participants window. Go ahead, Raj. You're muted. Yeah, a brief response to Sharon. Sharon, thank you. Yes, I agree with you. Yeah, it was a two-way street. So it wasn't Nixon opening. Um, from an American capitalist point of view, Nixon opened China. Uh, but from Chinese point of view, they open the United States, right? Because uh, they gain a market. They brought, yeah. So yeah, definitely China as a country benefited, I've said. And Chinese uh, Communist Party maintained control. So as, as I said, there is a China cannot be described very, in a very simple term. Uh, what they did was very smart, in my opinion. But I think think uh, it also contributed to the fall of the Soviet Union because it increased the pressure. Now in the rivalry between uh, the, the relationship between China and Russia became bad. Uh, and, and I think the mm, fault lies on both sides. So I'm not gonna go there, but uh, if, uh, if they had maintained a better relationship, mutual support, Comic Con and China and Russia together, there was a big enough common market that, that socialism wouldn't have collapsed. So uh, I think one of the uh, fault on side of Khrushchev is is that Khrushchev did not share the want to share the nuclear technology with China. Um, so there was Khrushchev's side; he wanted to be a big boss. I mean, USSR. And, but on China's side is that they, they wanted to get all the help from Soviet Union and also make all kinds of claims against the Soviet territory. And so, um, and I think this, this thing, uh, this, this fault lies with Mao himself, in my opinion. So anyway, both sides are at fault. I agree with you, the, the, the Chinese benefited uh, in terms of a country, but, and I also agree with you, that international perspective, uh, I don't, I'm not saying that American workers should blame Chinese workers. Workers, either country don't decide what happens to their life. It's somebody else who decides. In China, I think Gene was about to speak, will say, well, the Chinese workers decide because it's their party. But uh, I'm not sure even they decide. So uh, the party, 
uh, top, how well they are connected to the grassroots is, is something I don't know much about, so I wouldn't speak. But certainly in, in the United States, they don't. And American workers actually don't blame the Chinese workers. They blame their own rulers. Uh, they would like to get the jobs back, so they are susceptible to that pressure. No, no communist will say to blame one set of workers for another set of workers. I agree with you. That's, I think that's sufficient to respond. But I, I think China, you know, my main claim is, which is I think at variance with many people here, is that China is actually a capitalist society now. Okay. Okay, so um, next on the um, stack, we have Jean and then Norma. And again, I want to encourage people to uh, raise your hand from the participants list, ask questions. I'd like to get some good questions related to the ecology part of the presentation, which was very informative. So why don't you take it, uh, Gene? Go ahead and unmute yourself. You are. Okay. Well, I think so, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Sharon. And, and I, I just want to comment a little bit more on that uh, Nixon uh, Mao uh, thing. It was actually with Joe and Lai they met with, but I, I met with Mao also. And this was back during the Maoist period. And it wasn't opening China up to inflows of capital. It was trying to reach out some kind of agreement between the two. And this was back during the days of the Sino-Soviet split, the Khrushchev. Uh, Khrushchev lies were told about in 1956, weren't they? And then uh, I think this hap the, the um, deal that was made um, was between uh, um, again, Joe and Lai represent, and, and the Communist Party with, was dominated by Mao and uh, uh, Nixon. And Kissinger was the one that was there and made the secret trip and so forth. And his book is rather interesting take on China. And, uh, he, you know, one of the things uh, he says in there is that uh, I think he quotes Kant in terms of you know, perpetual peace, saying that it will come when the peoples of the world um, you know, resort to reason and decide to work for peace, or when it's at such a total catastrophe that uh, people will turn to peace as the only solution. And um, it's kind of interesting, I thought, uh, Kissinger's take on all that. Was Kissinger's yeah. statement you're saying? Pardon? That was Kissinger saying that? That was, a, yeah, in the final, uh, he was quoting the uh, philosopher Kant, I believe. So, oh. um, and he, he said that would be interesting, you know, if I, I forget, you know, I forget exact terminology, but it's worth taking a look at. Um, but then, um, it, then it was only after that, um, that the opening of China with the uh, trade deals and so forth took place under Deng Xiaoping. And, um, and again, um, the, the crushing of the counter-revolution, um, uh, which is uh, in 18, 1989, was part of that. But again, uh, that was a later thing. And uh, I think uh, the historical development, I think, is, is important here. Um, Two minutes. Yeah. Okay, so I would just, the only answer I would give to Jean is that uh, what happened in Tiananmen was not a crushing counter-revolution, but rather uh, crushing of the last remnants of revolutionary workers. And, and in order to bring capitalism to China, and, and that's, uh, uh, I have this book uh, and I've read it. I don't know if you can see it. It's called uh, The Great Reversal. Is written by William Hinton, and William Hinton was there uh, uh, 10 years. He was a consultant for grassland uh, development, uh, and he was eyewitness to what happened. And it's uh, described in the last chapter. He has positive things also about the changes, by the way. He doesn't, uh, uh, Hinton doesn't, uh, about Tiananmen, he's not, he's very negative, but about the reversal thing, there are plus and minuses he's showing in the countryside. So he's not all one-sided. In the end, uh, the last chapter is devoted to it. So I think, I mean, right now I'll give you a context. There's a farmer still going on, right? Farmers protest in India. If Modi government crushes it, 
and describes as a counter-revolution, would you accept it? No, I don't think so. Uh, it's a very mixed, co complicated issue, but it will not be called counter-revolution. Uh, and so was uh, it was not in, in the Tiananmen by the workers. Now, there, there are two sections, workers versus students. The student section was inspired by bourgeois thought, but the workers were mobilized because they saw uh, the state lifting all the uh, guarantees of, of jobs and things and going towards neoliberalism, which is what they did. Okay, next up is uh, Norma, followed by Richard uh, Fallenbaum. And again, if you have any questions, comments, go ahead and uh, raise your hand in the participants list. So Norma, go ahead. Um. Use of the word workers, the way we have been using it for the past decades, is dehumanizing. Uh, it, you understand what I mean. I don't have to elaborate that. Yeah, I sure do. There's I, heard, a, I heard this from you many times, yes. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, there was a time when people who worked people who grew food and built houses and uh, so forth, whatever they needed, whatever people needed to do and were able to do in whatever social structure they lived, were not workers per se, they were just people doing those things, shoemakers, so forth. And they became workers in a structure that has tended further and further into this categorizing of people by the contents uh, outside them. The people did not opt for those classifications. Uh, for example, the way that uh, people of certain ages are put into groups because they are certain ages rather than that they're human beings doing a couple of things or doing something. So I, I, the idea, what goes along with being a worker is that we have to insist that while we are required to demand jobs, it's because that's the only option for the 99% of us to be able to create survival for ourselves. A job is the relation between labor and capital. It is not the desired end of our lives or of our next 10 years. It's a necessity and it is not uh, to be venerated the way people going out to demand jobs appear to be excluding all aspects of humanity from the request that they're making. The other thing about uh, China is- Two minutes. Go ahead, finish your thought. Two minutes, we're in such a hurry because so many people want to talk. Huh? Um, that what is taught in the schools do you think that they learn all those things that we don't learn here in the United States about the social structure and uh, that there is an, a, a communist objective to China, so forth. So they're learning different things in school, the opposite in, in school from what people who are driven into having to take lessons from the capitalists approach to some, uh, you know, com for competition. Uh, the Chinese, we know, have learned other than competition in the school, uh, which is essential to capitalism. So uh, I, I agree with Gene, I think, has often said uh, that any place, he hasn't said it in these words, uh, but he's told it to me to where I say it. Uh, that people like those in China, like even the leftovers struggle in, in Russia, so forth, North Korea, people are struggling to build communism and that that makes them communist. 
Raj, you want to go ahead and comment? Um, I, I, you know, I don't agree with the last statement, but I generally, actually, my personal, I was just Norma, you were saying I reflected on my childhood. I, I, I my father believed that you only need, need to learn two things uh, in life. Rest you pick up. One is is mathematics. The other is English language because in, in English to him was very important. And Hindi, my mother tongue was spoken, so I will pick it up. So I was deficient in schools when I went to sixth grade and all that. But my benefic- benefit was that, uh, like you say, I wasn't socialized into the slavery system. So part of my rebelliousness about the system is coming from the fact I didn't go. So, I, I mean, I can relate to what you're saying. Yeah, I, I'm not advocating for to put people, uh, children into you know slave labor eight hours a day or anything like that. I'm advocating for age integration where people yeah. live and do things together. It's a very complex uh, objective, very difficult to sort out. I've been trying to say, oh, it has to be this or that, and I can't. But I do know that that overall idea instead of forcing children, somebody called it compulsory public education. <laughs> you know? uh, and we don't want that. We want people to be taking care of things together. And that has a lot to do with, by the way, the distribution of growing livestock. <clears throat> if you have small farms and sustainable processes, you don't have the pollution from growing. I mean, that's the same thing about anything about growing the plants out there. Uh, it's a whole other way of, of being on earth that we need to reclaim, not as workers, <laughs> but as human beings. Richard, do you want to go ahead? Ask your question. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Um, a comment more than uh, a response to Raj rather than a, a question. Um, couple of things. Uh, I think we're in the age of imperialism. So when you talk about capitalism being an established in some country or another, especially a major country, you're talking about imperialism and all the aspects of materialism. So you have to uh, show that, um, uh, that um, uh, imperialism is also established in China and, um, and in Russia for that matter. Um, you know, I think, it's, I think it's very useful that uh, Raj talked about the ecology question, um, uh, this whole question uh, in that context. You know, in, in, the, in the Soviet Union during the Stalin period, um, there was a decision, obviously a decision made to, to downplay, to, to to not worry about the destruction of the environment, there was a there was a priority to to um, develop the industrial economy at a breakneck speed. That involved destruction, wanton destruction of the environment. It involved um, uh, exploitation of labor at an enormous level, much greater than um, in China today. There were labor camps. You know, um, it's not just propaganda. This thing went on, um, and it was a necessary. You know, the the the, the tragic part. Th- these these things were necessary because of the the nature of the the world struggle, the impending war with uh, imperialism. Uh, in this case, on which uh, the Nazis were the the proxies for U.S. and and the other imperialist countries. Now we have a, a similar. Uh, China, China and Russia face a similar situation, and they, they have to make important um, uh, choices and priorities um, to, to develop their economy, to develop their d- defense capacity, to develop their culture, and so forth. And, um, uh, you know, it's not just a question of um, picking out certain things, um, certain uh, statistics about what's happening in, a, in a, this or that country. We have to look at the whole picture. I think it's a really important. Um, we talk about the Sino-Soviet split. I think the, the, 
the uh, success of um, uh, the Chinese leadership and the Russian leadership in establishing a new new unity around an anti-imperialist um, uh, program, basically, uh, is is world historic. And to 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 uh, ignore that, I think, not ignore that, but to um, uh, not see it is a big mistake, and um, uh, and it it, 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 it um, we see that in in for instance in the uh, in the weakness of the Bernie Sanders campaign, where he uh, he he caved into anti-China and anti-Russian uh, um, um, propaganda, and in fact the the Part of the popularity of Trump was his 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 uh, one desire to, to end imperialist wars, particularly against Russia and to a, to a lesser extent China. So, but of course, the 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 the, the left, we so called, is incapable of, of do, making that leap. So that's that's part of the crisis of the. The, the working class in the United States today and, and in the other capitalist countries. Okay, so if I were to respond to your comment, what I would say, and I will say it briefly, uh, in the age of imperialism, everybody's not an imperialist. You know, even um, when Lenin was writing it, the question came about Argentina. Argentina was a capitalist country, but was not an imperialist country. So you could, in the age of Imperialism, everybody's not imperialist. Okay, so I Every would say- Every capitalist is. Every capitalist is. No, no, Argentina was capitalist at that time. You can read Lenin's uh, book on uh, imperialism and other writings, you know, you'll find that. So uh, China uh, is, is not an imperialist. So the definition of imperialist countries is where export of capital is very significantly uh, a part of it. Now in China, export of capital is becoming significant, but it is not overwhelming. China is still a exporter of commodities, you know, consumer commodities by, by and large. So, and Russia, same way. I mean, they're exporter of uh, raw, you know, uh, um, commodities like, uh, uh, you know, petroleum commodities and gas. So, uh, both of them are uh, cannot be classified as, as imperialist country. China is maybe approaching it that that point, but it's not so far. And as I said, China is a special case because the Communist Party rules. So the, I never put it in the same category. So um, you can't apply these uh, uh, categories and then decide what it is because we know the category. You have to see what's going on, and sometimes you, you can define it quite in those categories. So I don't define China, and yes, I don't, I, as I said, China has to be defended by all of us against U.S. threats to it, okay? Any other country, the United States, we should defend uh, those countries. Uh, U.S. has no right to attack China, even if China is capitalist country or not capitalist country, social country has no right. But that doesn't change the analysis, the fact that China is part of that capitalist, uh, that the China and the United States needed each other, okay? One to apply the uh, excess capital, the other one needed, needed the capital. Now, what developed in China, are you denying then that in what has developed is a class society? So what, what was it under Mao that if, if China today is socialist, what was it under Mao? It wasn't socialist. I mean, there, there, Mao was trying to reduce inequality. Mao was trying to get to a collectivized uh, 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 production for benefit of the people. So uh, he failed. I mean, there's some failure there. Uh, I, I'm not a great student of that thing, but, and as I said, uh, in this short book, Great Reversal, he does give credit to what they call the responsibility system in the countryside, called the responsibility system, which means basically uh, introducing the idea of profit, you're responsible for your production and sales and marketing and all that. So he, he's, he's, he's not saying that everything was negative that came under and certainly China has benefited. 
So I, this I would respond to you is that China today characterizes to me a, a peculiar thing where it is a capitalist economy, but run by a cap, uh, socialist uh, party, I mean, a communist party. So to me, uh, it is uh, a riddle. I mean, I don't, kind of, I don't admit to, I mean, I, I, I lay down my cards in front of you. I'm not trying to uh, be anti-China or pro-China. I'm saying, I'm seeing what I see and I tell you what I see. Okay, next is uh, uh, Mehmet. Uh, okay. If you have any questions, everybody raise your hand. Um, uh, from the participants window, comments or questions. Go ahead, Mehmet. Uh, thank you, Raj, for a great presentation. Uh, several things comes to mind. One is that we in the United States do have a large middle class, as they are called in the world, uh, and a lot of people who think they're in the middle class. So uh, if, the, if we are pushing for socialist uh, way of life, socialism, and you mentioned and criticized rightfully that China is trying to create that middle class by capitalism. So what is our message to the people here? Uh, and how are we going to distinguish ourselves from the capitalist propaganda that comes uh, to them saying that uh, Bernie Sanders and the rest uh, of the socialists are going to uh, make you poor. You're going to give your house, you're going to give up your car, you're going to live a miserable life. So uh, does this middle class living fit into, first of all, an ecological way of living, second to a socialist uh, way of living? That's number one. Second thing is uh, the new Green New Deal. Uh, if you can please uh, go into that one, e even if it's at a very high level, on uh, what it means and does it uh, does it contribute to anything to uh, either the ecology or to the socialist uh, movement. Third uh, and the last point is that in China, uh, you mentioned that you are not against China. That's fine, and that you are for uh, you know uh, pro protecting it if uh, you know being attacked by the imperials, which uh, they are under attack. But it still doesn't uh, uh, resolve the issue of the contradiction between the workers, the workers' movement, and the Chinese. Uh, uh, government or uh, let's say the Chinese system. What, uh, what happens is that like in today in Namibia and in other places where Chinese government supported capital is exploiting the workers in Africa or other, other uh, investments or forget about the Africa or other places inside China. There are contradictions between the workers and the uh, Chinese government and its support of the millionaires, the billionaires who exploit them. And it's very interesting that if we were to support the workers and their movements, if you look at the right-wing imperialist, uh, Free Radio Asia, CIA, NED, uh, monies, they are all going uh, 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 behind the veil of workers' rights and workers' conditions in China slave labor in China, so on and so forth. So it's a very, very thin road to follow. And I'm really at a loss on how to defend the workers against Chinese uh, system, let me say, uh, or, and not to fall uh, supporting the imperialists who are pretending to um, care for the workers. So uh, if you can please go into these, thanks so much. Not sure I can answer your tough questions, but um, the, I mean, about the propaganda thing, I mean, what uh, US uh, and system has a huge propaganda arm, right? So uh, they take anything and blow it up. I mean, that's how the whole election system works. Suddenly Biden, who was for uh, you know, against the working people, and now suddenly he's the protector and everybody's buying into his goodness. So this is a difficulty of our age where uh, those of us, we are, first of all, very insignificant 
the left is very, very small, insignificant numbers, not insignificant in the power of their ideas and what uh, they can do to influence people. Uh, because when the time comes, that will become very important. So in uh, you know Chinese capital is exploiting. I mean it cannot but do that if if you are going to abide by the rules of capital. And so that's why socialist economics is different. I mean Soviet economics was different even under Khrushchev it was different. Okay, so uh, that had that system had to be demolished. In China it's a transition. And uh, they have successfully transitioned it. And I don't know how workers feel in China, but I doubt anybody who consistently, this is consistent, they're working 46 hours a week has much time left to themselves. And, and uh, how could it not be a feeling that somebody is really benefiting on my behalf and it's not me? I mean, I may be making a better living, um, uh, I mean, that's how a lot of American workers also feel, but they think that there's no other choice um, until things got so bad for half the people, they, they backed a, a populist like Trump. So about propaganda, I can't answer, but you know, we have to stand for what is, what is our objective? We are very small, and even if we lose our objective, mix it up with the uh, with capitalist objectives and capitalist definition of what is wealth and what is, uh, what is our goal, uh, then uh, what hope is there for us to make any kind of impact? So that's first thing is that you have to be honest and say, look, this, isn't, uh, this is not the standard living. I mean, you saw the picture, uh, the same I saw, many other people saw, Miles long line where people waiting in their cars, some in their SUVs in, in Texas for free food that was being given out. Now, some of them were certainly capable of buying that food, but the fact that you own an automobile no longer is a sign of well-to-do men in America. You know, <laughs> it's uh, the first thing I've seen these uh, people from uh, Nepal come and do here, young men from Nepal who come here, young men and women. Uh, and Nepal is certainly even poorer than India. And, Nepal, and the first thing they do is go buy a new, uh, <laughs> new car because uh, credit gives them. And then they work like hell 16 hours a day paying for it, Uber driving or something like that. And then they are doing also their education. So that's, you know, the... Uh, the poverty cannot be judged by the same appearance we used to judge. The nature of poverty has changed. So Texas people standing in the line. So in China, I mean, the thing is, I fully sympathize with China. It's stuck when you're imperialist, what they do is they exclude you from the economic system. That's their power. If they cannot crush you uh, militarily, because that will be too difficult after, after Vietnam War, they've learned somewhat. So they attack very, very uh, defenseless countries. But if you can't attack, they try to also weaken you by economic embargo. And so it's a tough fight, I agree with you. And if China took a path towards this direction, I don't blame them in the sense that every country has a right to develop the way they want to. All I'm saying is from a class point of view, uh, that's not the direction if you are struggling for socialism. And China is becoming actually a, a, on the verge of becoming an imperialist country. Now, Russia, I don't think is an imperialist country because its investments of capital outside is almost very small, it's very tiny. So it's basically, that's how I define it. Uh, Russia probably has less export of capital than does India. So uh, China is very big in, I mean, it's the, uh, I think is the second single biggest investor of capital outside of its, uh, its own land. And that, that capital is not invested like Soviet help to third world, which was not for profit. That was for, uh, for influence against and fight against imperialism. So I, I, I think some of the points you're making, I'm not able to respond, but but that's about all I can say in response to your amendment. Okay, next up is uh, Susan and Michael. So if you wanna go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Hello everyone, this is Susan. 
Uh, thank, thank you, Raj, a lot. Um, in the 1980s, there were a, no a number of uh, people on the left and groups on the left that described the Soviet Union as state capitalism. I have not noticed you using that term. Could you talk about that? A little bit. Uh, so state capitalism is uh, uh, what Lenin talks about in 1921. You know, he says uh, there are four forms of economic system and, and state capitalism is something we should aspire to. That's what he says, that we're so, things were so bad at the end of civil war. But what developed under Stalin was not state capitalism. What, uh, what it was afterwards, state capitalism is basically where state governs, basically governs the controls that capitalist development in the country. This may be more uh, applicable to China than it is to, it ever was to Soviet Union. Soviet Union, basically, they socialized it. There was some uh, semi-private uh, production going on in uh, collective farms. You know, one type of collective farms were like that. There were state farms, and there are two other kinds of collective farms. One in which everything was shared, including winter coats, but not women. There, that, was an, <laughs> that, was, that was a propaganda against them by the West. The, and, and chickens and you know, uh, the, the, whatever they grew in their plot was also shared. The other one was where you kept your coat and your boots and your chickens were yours. And, and, and then you only the production for market or what the state took from you in return for support was there, but they controlled it very strongly. And I think that similar claim is also made on China. I think Gene has made that claim that 90% of the profit is taken out of these private Thing. So they're not very powerful. Politically, they're insignificant. Now, I, I don't know that for sure, but, but on the whole, the state capitalism cannot lead. Uh, I mean, it's a transitionary stage, which is what Chinese says that I think this is a transition. And it may be that I will be surprised if I live long enough. I don't think I'll live to be uh, 100 years old. So well, that would be 1950, right? 30 more years, yeah, I'll be over 100. So, I mean, they could switch and they say, well, that's it. We're done with this, socialize everything. We're socialists now. And just like uh, we intended always and we fooled the West, okay? So, I mean, that could happen, but what are the chances? I mean, the thing is, if I'm a, if I'm a party member and you, you are, uh, let's say I'm a cap capitalist, okay? I'm, 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 I'm hiring people and Susan, you are, party member and your son needs a better job than he's, you know, he's no good son, I assume, I assume that's for a moment. You may have a son who's very good, but don't take it personally. So you want him to get a job, you know, and I'm a, you know, communist party member who can get you a favored, uh, uh, you know, location for your business, a branch of this thing. How, how long would it be before these two people meet and, and start doing something. I mean, do you think that is not going on in China? I mean, I, 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 I hear there's a lot of thing going on and Xi Jinping has heavily attacked that and successfully to a large extent uh, is what I hear. But I think once capital rises, this interpenetration of capitalist ideology and capitalists with the party is inevitable. That was happening in Soviet Union. And that's what happened in Kieran Kenny's book actually, uh, uh, and his videos actually explain the process of undoing. So that will not happen to China. I don't know, but uh, the fact is that capitalist production is taking place in China. You know, recently they uh, put down, uh, you know, the uh, guy, Alibaba's guy, right? He's, uh, uh, forget his name. Uh, uh, Ma, Jack Ma. So Jack Ma is a billionaire, okay? Jack Ma's firms is a software firm, right? And they have a 996 rule, okay? Nine to nine, you work from nine in the morning to nine in the evening, six days a week. That's a 996 rule, okay? That's not in general working condition, but this is an electronic, you know, in a computer thing. So he's a billionaire, and recently he tried to uh, make his his shares go Alibaba go public. 
Why? Because he wanted to be, turn into finance capitalist. Okay, you sell out shares, and, and then you have the money, and you go into finance. That's what uh, Ford and General Motors are doing. And party blocked it. Okay, the party had the power and shut it down. Now, so that shows the Communist Party makes a difference there. But what's behind that we don't know. You know, there could be competing interests and all that. So it may be they're jockeying for power. And Jack Ma wouldn't have done it unless he had some backing in the party, right? So he lost, but we don't know the politics in the party. So I don't know. But the point is the Chinese capitalism is investing in Africa and other countries for profit now. And that's the nature of how could, how capitalism decides the nature of society, not, not a communist party decides the nature of society in the end. So you either shut down capitalism or you yield to it. And I think the Chinese are yielding to it. That's all I can say about it. Okay, next up is uh, Sharon followed by Jean. We only have about five more minutes. So uh, go ahead, okay. Sharon. Thank you. Um, on the question of fighting against global warming and doing what we, we can to slow it down or avoid the ultimate catastrophe, um, my understanding is that the Green New Deal is based on the idea that going green, doing uh, combating climate change can is could be very profitable for capital, which I think is probably true objectively. If they are, were to invest in um, doing away with fossil fuels, the use of fossil fuels and all the rest and green infrastructure and, what, and all the rest of the stuff that's being talked about, solar on every rooftop, they would profit a lot. And so um, it seems to me that what I don't understand is why capital is not embracing that. And maybe they are in some ways, or maybe they will. I don't, I don't know. But um, certainly the Green New Deal is not a revolutionary or you know, socialist thing in and of itself. Um, and that, that's, that's one comment I have that you might have a view on, Raj. And the other comment, the other thing I wanted to ask was, I don't understand why it is a good thing to produce electricity for, by burning natural gas and then turn around and say that we're going to ban natural gas in new, develop, uh, new buildings. So, you know, my house is heated by gas, my hot water is heated by gas, and my stove runs on gas. And I'm, all of a sudden, I realized that, you know, the city of Oakland has passed this ordinance saying no, no, build, new, new buildings have to be all electric. But, and I'm feeling guilty that I have all this gas in my house. But I, I don't understand what the difference is, you know, because they're just producing that electricity with fossil fuels. Okay, uh, I mean, Sandeep made a presentation on, on the viability of solar power, for example, and he's here, he can answer about its viability if there's a question. But I mean, I think so, you know, the resistance to change is because uh, power of the uh, fossil fuel industry is very, very high and the new technology capitalists are mm, coming up to that backed by the, uh, you know, uh, capitalist of uh, computer, you know, technologies. So I think in the Biden probably it'll go. And you're right. I don't think this is a class thing. So it's an environmental thing, right? In the end, I think they have to respond. They will not respond because it's a class question. They'll respond to the extent that it is a question for every, all classes in which, uh, so they don't want to die. The rich don't want to die. And also, and sometimes you get saved because rich don't want to die and you kind of get saved by them, but that's not their intent. They're, and in that the struggle for profit, who makes the profit, it's all that will go on. About the blocking of uh, gas, I'm not an expert on that, but my guess is it's the emissions from it, just like the car. 
you know, electric cars, you control where the emissions are, which is with the electric uh, company and maybe at central point, you can control it better. In, so, in any case, away from the urban center. Maybe that's the logic why electric uh, thing, and I'm sure a uh, company like General Electric are very happy about it. You know, so there's all these competing interests. And, uh, but I, I think it's because it's become an issue almost a moral issue now, <laughs> people. Uh, if you don't do it, you, you're supposed to be guilty. Um, but the uh, question about uh, how effective are these technology, I myself feel a little bit guilt because I've been sitting over uh, you know, panels on my roof issue uh, for years and I, I haven't gotten over it because I keep saying, okay, how much is, uh, is it actually going to save and is it uh, a solution? Uh, so I think Sandeep can answer more about the efficiency and solution on on these technologies, uh, if you cares to answer that, but I'm, I, that's about all I can say. Okay, um, Gene, do you want to um, go ahead? I think that's pretty much gonna be our last question and we'll give Roger a couple of minutes to sum up because we're getting close to 12.30. So Gene? Okay, I'm back on, sorry. Um, mm -hmm. You can hear me now, right? Yeah. Yep. No, yep. I can see okay. you. No, I don't, uh, the, the, um, on the whole question of China, um, you know, I, I spent a lot of last time uh, talking about China and various misconceptions. I think a lot of those misconceptions are floating around here. And most of them I have, I answered already last week at our session. So that's been recorded and I won't go further on that. Also just mentioned this book by, Fan, by William Hinton, Fan Shen. I think Hinton is the wisest voice on China. I used his uh, book uh, for as a required textbook of my anthropology classes for 30 years. And I still think that that gives you better insight about why you think China had to have a revolution and how that revolution took place. And it was very, just recommend that very highly. So I'll stop there. But refer people back to that. I don't need to respond. So go ahead to the next person. Uh, you have actually, uh, Roger. Roger, you go, ahead. You go ahead. I I basically uh, don't have a, sec a summary prepared for this. So all I wanted to bring about the issue of ecologies tied to to capitalism, and and in more in especially after 1945, where the uh, capitalist uh, systems around the globe, and, and it unfortunately also includes China, and I'm not blaming China, but I mean, I'm saying it's, it's a big production center, and have become a problem. And China at least is it has a goal towards uh, reducing things. So in that sense, uh, and, and, and who is the Western countries who have polluted the world for 100 years uh, to uh, <laughs> tell India and China, don't pollute, you know? Uh, the, so there's a, no moral standing on it. Uh, I think, however, this is a serious issue for our time. According to some scientists, we have only 10 years after which the system will become, environment system become even more destructive and unstable. We're already seeing signs of it. So I think capitalism has to be dealt with. And unfortunately, you cannot go there without uh, ecologically balanced or ecologically healthy metabolism in nature without overthrow of capital. And that's about all I want to say. Thank you very much. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much, Raj, for your presentation. Thank you, everybody. What we're going to do now is we're going to shift over to the open discussion part of our session. So everybody can uh, feel free to join in. I actually have to leave, but uh, we usually stay on until about one o'clock, but I want to thank you for your wide ranging uh, presentation. I want to thank everybody for your questions. So uh, we'll go from there. And thank you, you Alan, week. for moderating. Thank you. And we'll so maybe Mehmet, if you don't mind, you moderate, be the moderator for this What's session. the difference? What's the difference if we have a moderator from what was been going on? If, if needs to be, otherwise Mehmet won't intervene if it gets ugly or something. Oh boy, okay. Well, Richard has his hand up and I have my hand up. So yeah, 
So let's uh, let's start from the top then. Richard, uh, if you can, please uh, go ahead. Unmute yourself, please. Richard, if you can unmute yourself. He may have stepped away. Okay, then let's go to Gene. Going once, going no, twice. No, I apologize. I, uh, no worries. I meant to lower my hand after I talked, but I didn't, so. No worries, no worries. Okay, Norma, it's your turn. Yeah. Um, one of the things, uh, I think it was Raj said something about what learning needs to be done. We learn all our lives. We have to stop discrediting this kind of behavior. Human beings learn, we teach each other, we learn together from the time, actually from a few months, we, you know, from a few weeks before we come out of the womb, we're learning and it goes on and has to be respected. It is disdained. We have to have had education with degree papers saying we got through kindergarten, we got through eighth grade, which is nonsense. We also, that discards the teaching that children do of us who hang, you know, for, that, that two-year-olds do of us who hang around them, that 10-year-olds do of us, so forth. A whole lot more respect needs to go on between us about our teaching and learning. Um, another thing I've had a question about if China is being imperialist, that, that it invests in Africa and well, and of course it's carrying oil to Venezuela, which is just, you can't say enough good things about it. <laughs> um, without without uh, a profiting from doing that, unless you, you're right, unless there is actual profiting from that. And I don't know about that. The other thing I don't know about is that we once had some lesson on how Tiananmen uh, wasn't such a huge problem in, in crowds that started out. It was a, a, a confrontation problem outside of the square uh, as days progress so that we need to stop focusing on Tiananmen having been a, mur a slaughter site by China, but that there were confrontations and they were probably like confrontations that go on today which brought, bring in the uh, white uh, uh, nationalists into confrontation as well as bringing in the, uh, the left resistance. <clears throat> uh, just, just a comment about those two things. But learning, learning is ours and they steal it. They commodify it like everything else. They like water, like air, but we need to take our stuff back. I, 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 yeah, I generally agree with you, but although, you know, I would say that life has stages. So, you know, the first period of first zero to twenties, you know, there's an intense amount of learning going on. And then you have sufficient skills to participate more as a productive member of society from 20 to 60. Then you become kind of a, like a teacher, you know, your abilities, physical ability, mental abilities are not as good, or, or they could be good, you know, but Oh, that's so, so that's then, so, that's almost racist. That's, that's so, it, it's so meaning, it's so wrong. It is so much a product of our oppressive hierarchical arrangement. You don't know whether somebody is going to be really, capable at the age of seven of solving problems or at the age of 70 and of teaching those things. You don't know those things ahead I'm of time. About general patterns. I'm talking general patterns. They're I know. Patterns. I'm talking general too. And I'm, anyway. Okay. Well, then you and I are going for a 26 mile jog together. As if we could go to a sit together. <laughs> <laughs> so there was my point. <laughs> okay. Uh, is uh, Richard, uh, Richard Fallenbaum, are you there? Uh, I think you had your hand up. Are you back? I think he's probably attending to his grandchildren. It could be. Okay. 
So anybody else? Uh, do you want to expand on anything, Raj? Uh, any any point you feel you may have left out? Well, I you know the thing is nature. In my sense is nature will always be there, right? Because you know, I, I mean, Amer the systems that we have right now, production systems and exchange systems and all that, the economy that global economy is built by capital is very injurious to nature, but nature will exist. The problem is uh, habitat is becoming very bad for humanity. And, and that's what we're talking about. Humanity will never die. It's my conviction. Even if there was a big nuclear exchange, some people will survive. The question is, as Khrushchev said, uh, uh, will, uh, what will happen? He said the living will envy the dead, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, it's what kind of world do we want? That's the issue about ecology. And uh, the idea of separation from nature uh, is, is the problem is that, you know, for profit reason, this is happening. And this is happening in India, it's happening in China, this is happening in the United States, it's happening to these uh, last remaining, uh, uh, you know, forest in Latin America, right, in Brazil. And so this is, the, this is the problem. So how do you come out of it? You come out of it by changing the system. You, I don't think within this system of profit making, it is possible. Of course, until it's overthrown, you pressure for the best way to reduce it. That's all you can do. You know, and China, for example, by 2060, they said they'll be carbon neutral. But then some Bernie Sanders was saying based on some scientific thing that all we got is 10 years, right? I don't know who's right. So if they are going to be carbon neutral in, the, in the 2060 China, which is actually, uh, is actually a leadership role they're taking on environment. So that's deficient by this standard. And the United States, uh, Trump, of course, said we're even walking away, which now we'll see what Biden says, but they, they will be more committed to it. But let's see what happens. Um, I, think, I think the overthrow of capital is a requirement for humanity to survive in a decent way, uh, long term. And I'm, long term has become short term now. Look at, look at the effect it's having uh, today on our lives this summer, I was just think, thinking, should I leave California? I mean, I can't leave. My children live here. We're too invested here. But look at the fire is coming closer and closer to you. Yusuf. Yeah, Yusuf, go ahead, please. Uh, well, one uh, thing I'm, uh, that had impressed me uh, uh, about China, and this has to do with ecology, uh, uh, the, this was a Okay, we've got to find out where that um, uh, entertainment is coming from. Somebody turn something off. There you go. Maybe. No, no I think, uh, Yusuf, do you have a hum? Uh, anything? Oh, okay. Let me, let me. Uh, it's coming from yeah, yeah. the 777. Okay, I muted it. I muted yeah. it. Go ahead, Yusuf. I'm so sorry. Uh, oh, it's still on. No, Yusuf, I think it's, yeah. Uh, much better now. Yeah, there's a hum from your system, I think. Yeah. Mehmet is un unmuted. I'll unmute and see what happens. It's gone. Yeah, much better. It's Yusuf. Uh, I don't know. It, it may be some background. Uh, yeah, it looks like there's interference. Yeah, if you have some uh, uh, cell phone, etc., close to your computer, it can do that. But why don't you just let him uh, make his point? It'll take a couple of minutes to spend more yeah. time, you know, trying oh, to. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Good idea. Yeah, go ahead, Yusuf. Uh, make it brief uh, because of the hum. Go ahead. Uh, uh, okay, sorry. I, I, I don't know what's doing it. I don't hear anything. That's okay. Uh, so just, uh, uh, just continue with it, and uh, uh, we'll. Uh, and then you'll mute it. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, the, the, this was a a, a program uh, on on Al Jazeera on China, and it was a, a negative. It was supposed to be a negative uh, uh, a program, but uh, we 
apparently in western China there was supposed there is this lake and it was uh, uh, pristine and uh, you know uh, a very beautiful so what happened is uh, many hotels were built around it and uh, it got polluted um, uh, Xi Jinping uh, visited the lake uh, you know and he was uh, he was shocked at the uh, condition of the lake. So he shut down the, uh, uh, the hotels until they get their uh, uh, solution, uh, 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 until they clean up their uh, uh, charge into the lake. So uh, the, um, the program was uh, he, supposed to be a statement uh, 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 in favor of the hotel owners, but it is impressive uh, that the state would shut down uh, the uh, uh, private enterprises until they, uh, 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 until they uh, meet certain standards, uh, which wouldn't happen in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, and, and so this demonstrates the power of the Communist Party. Uh, uh, they're still alive there. Uh, it happen in a, in a capitalist country. So that uh, I, uh, I want to share that. I have frequently mentioned this. Okay, thank you. Uh, My sorry. response to Yusuf is that, didn't you see that they have shut down hotels and and restaurants here in California and in your place now because of pandem pandemic, so they can do it here also. Uh, yeah, but uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we, well, people are getting sick and dying immediately. They, they clearly because of, uh, of the lake, uh, they are not uh, uh, dying immediately. But they, they cleaned up LA. I mean, LA was very polluted air in the 60s and the word uh, smog, uh, smog came out of that, the very term smog, and they cleaned it up. So I think it's, a, uh, it's not true that only China responds to this. Well, uh, oh, 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 okay, China uh, uh, did that in a very efficient way. And uh, uh, this was merely to, uh, uh, it preserves uh, beauty. Okay, there wasn't any immediate benefit uh, other than that. Uh, uh, well, obviously, it, it, during the pandemic, and uh, in in the U.S. here, uh, there's uh, uh, much opposition uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the shutdown. They don't shut down enough. They they shut down much more efficiently in Vietnam and China. Uh, uh, and other uh, and, and 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 Cuba, uh, I, I don't know, but uh, certainly in Vietnam and China, the, uh, they shut down in India. Very harsh, very harsh shut down in India. And India is not a socialist state. They did it in Taiwan. They did it in South Korea. Yusuf, is are your wires plugged into your wherever they're uh, plugged into? Are they plugged in tightly? Sometimes that's what that hum is from. Okay, well, I'll, I'll 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 check up uh, check that. Okay. Way. I think Susan or Michael want to say something. Hello again. Hi. Um, okay. What I, what I want to say is there's a whole section of the left called the eco socialist movement, which um, Ian. <clears throat> Ian, uh, what's his last name? Ian Angus. Angus and uh, John Bellamy Foster are part of, and I consider myself part of it too. Although I, I, I they and I and I, a lot of other people believe that that socialism includes eco socialism. That eco socialism is not something different. Um, my practical suggestion here is to invite one of them to come and talk particularly Ian, because he may be available. Yeah. I, we, we had Joel Covell, who is a, an ardent yeah. enthusiast over uh, the eco-social. Right, but he's, he's gone. 
and that was a long time ago. Right. I'm just I, mentioning what, it because yeah. I, you know, he's a good fellow. <laughs> right. Um, what I there, and eco socialist a lot a lot of us believe that this climate crisis, I the campaign to deal with the climate crisis is the is a route to to socialism advocacy structural working on reform reforms that need to happen to preserve the planet et cetera et cetera so I think it's very important and uh, hope that we'll have more discussion about it this this discussion I mean um, today was very good Raj and it the, the, and China's a part of it because China's such a, such a big country and, and um, dealing with issues, climate issues. And that in itself is a whole topic that various people have written about. Thank you. We have to raise Stephen Jay Gould. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anybody else? All I, right. I, I, had a, I had a couple of comments. Uh, sure, can you go ahead, Sandy. Uh, so, if you, so first of all, the Communist Party uh, can decide to uh, to allow capitalism to grow. It did that in Russia and it did that in China, and that itself does it. It is a reversal because, in a sense, it means that you know the Communist Party could not develop the productive forces in a society based on socialist methods, and that it had to resort to you know growth of capital to do that. But it, it can do that. It did that in Russia. It, that, it did that in China too. But I, I think if you look at Chinese, the growth of capitalism in China, uh, yeah, it has, China has evolved from evolve, you know, exporting simple commodities to complex technology products. Chinese companies are now vying to dominate the world market in major technology sectors. So China is, capitalism is China is no longer like, you know, you know, you know, just growing productive forces to bring China at parity. You know, China is at a stage today where it is exporting capital and complex technology products. And this is why there has been so much US, you know, restrictions on China is not because China is, you know, China's productive forces are growing, but because Chinese companies are now competing in the worldwide arena. And it has, it has gotten to a point where Raj was mentioning and financials. Now, Xi Jinping personally took a decision to clip down and financial, which is a subsidiary of Alibaba. But I think that was more because and financials has a credit reserve ratio because it's a fintech company, much, much lower than Chinese banking system. And the Chinese Communist Party th saw that as a threat, you know, having having such le high levels of credit being, you know, given out by a company with such low credit reserve ratio that it was a potential threat to the stability of the Chinese you know, financial system. So I just don't think that it was just a Chinese capitalist who was growing too big. It was much more than that. So I think there is definitely you know, this whole thing about you know, Chinese capitalism growing to a point where it, it's self-sustaining you know, accumulation reaches a point where it can just destroy whatever you know, socialist state that is there in China is, is a real threat that needs to be considered very seriously. The other thing, you know, this example that Yusuf gave about, you know, the the lake and how she, I mean, we, we want the people of that area to decide whether the lake can be polluted or not. We don't want diktats from Chinese leadership to go and tell us whether a lake is polluted or not. That is not the kind of socialism that we want to build. So clearly, while it is good that Xi Jinping did that, but it really tells us that the local people had no power to, you know, intervene in the pollution of the lake against the real estate lobby, which was going and building, you know, hotels there. I, I want to also quickly comment on the question that Sharon was asking. So if you look at the uh, decarbonization in California, California has a plan to decarbonize the electric grid by 2045. And just the carbon emission from electricity generation is now a very small fraction of overall carbon emission in California. It's probably like 10 or 12%. While transportation is 50%, buildings are another, all the gas and everything we consume for heating and cooking and uh, drying is probably another like 10, 15%. So in the next phase of decarbonization, California is putting a lot more attention on transportation and on electrification of buildings. And that is why you see that uh, 
you know there are now new regulations on you know new buildings should be fully electric buildings because that is the next phase of decarbonization in california so yes there is ongoing attempt to decarbonize california grid by 2045 and that is well underway and as a part of that natural gas consumption is being reduced but you know the emphasis is now on decarbonization of buildings and decarbonization of transportation so sandeep thank you sandeep yeah thank you yeah uh, thanks sandeep and i just wanted to one make an observation that you were talking about how chinese big companies are the reason why that states is now anti china because it threatens their own monopolies somewhat and i mentioned that one case and actually what is happening is this uh, this is this is the discovery of uh, uh putin in his phd thesis is that only the largest monopolies if you have a huge monopolies that's the only way we'll have anything uh in a business otherwise it'll be wiped out and that's that's what modi is trying to do now is to develop monopolies in india which are giant enough to compete in the world and there so farmer steer is related to that because he's going to hand over uh, a lot of this farming to the big capitalist class uh, in this process and what will happen to the people of course you know there will be more people who will be homeless more people suffering i mean but the the point is either you have a socialist construction which was uh, something like the russian construction which also is very painful and not free of its problems or you have capitalist development these are the two logic the middle class development society is not able to function within the existence of monopoly capital that's that's the point here and in china if they are forced to develop, develop monopoly they are they are experiencing the same thing that putin's phd thesis actually was on is to have to have a few giant monopolies to be to be sustainable in the world market because the west is so dominant in it so all these problems are problems of dealing of dealing with capitalism in its monopoly stage and which is a subject of uh, lenin's thesis uh, in 100 years ago but now it's a it comes back in a different format and a different place so anyway yeah but what you're saying is very very relevant thanks i think we are we got 5 minutes left remaining for this session uh mehmet how about your uh, for the comments did I, i did i kind of not answer some part of you i mean i i think well a, a one kind that we left and i think uh, in the chat it's been going on is that you know again our consumption is at such a level that it is threatening the uh, you know the whole environment and the and the pla- uh, planet uh, but uh, once we come to a certain level like in the united states or in some parts of europe how do you uh promote socialism when at the same time you tell these people that oh you're no longer going to have a car you're no longer going to heat your home with natural gas so there is a you know observed or a or a discussion of stepping back for some people <laughs> who do consume much more than the others at the expense of the planet and at the expense of the others so how do you promote this how do you bring this one up as saying look this is the right thing to do you know uh, i think the circumstances are teaching people you know the idea of personal car is already declining at least in the younger people because they are able to call with their cell phone a uber ride or something and owning cars is is expensive and and where would you park if you're just living in a little tiny place which is happening to a lot of people they're living in tiny places now and this is a, this is the late stage of capital uh, i would say declining capitalism in the united states is doing and uh, so uh, i think this is a circumstances force people to Uh, do this thinking that job of the communist is to point out what is happening and eventually the people say okay i see i see what you have been telling me is true and then would they become a force right so the whole point of communist thinking is you are a few steps ahead of 
of the curve. That's what you're supposed to be if you're a communist. There is no, if there is an alternative for transportation, if there is sufficient public transportation, and that has to be contrived in such a way as to take care of people who can't walk to the bus, as well as you know people who can go by other alternative means. Anyway, we need to provide adequate public transportation, of course, free, cheap, safe, pleasant. And a public transportation, we've seen, can be very pleasant. There was this great uh, uh, documentary, uh, and the word is going to slip my mind now, uh, but uh, talking about pulling up the tracks in LA, which they did in Chicago near my house, pulling up the uh, uh, electric, uh, you know, the streetcars. And, uh, that so they showed people on, on the corner uh, before that waiting for the streetcar, having a pleasant time together. <laughs> oh, yeah. Before the pandemic, you know, there were those ferries across the bay where you could get a cocktail and drink and then go to work. I mean, I would do that any day. <laughs> well, I, I have one more comment if there is time. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, okay, so I, I also want you to comment on Green New Deal since there were a couple you know, comments there. Uh, one is uh, Biden's platform is the same as the European consensus, which is net zero 2050, which is being carbon neutral by 2050. Now, the carbon neutral by 2050 by itself is a very dangerous argument because what it really depends on is, hey, you con continue consuming oil and emitting carbon but you're going to grow more forests and trees and things like that to offset it. And the earth has a certain limited capacity to offset how much carbon you can emit. Right. And, and that really amounts to like 10 or 15 years of overall sort of carbon emissions. You can't offset like in perpetuity. You can offset it only for a little while. So, so the Green New Deal and, and so by all calculations, even if Europe and US and China is able to meet, meet net zero 2060, by all sort of you know calculations, this will still lead to like two and a half or three degree rise by the end of this century, even assuming that that kind of a trajectory is followed under capitalism, which is highly sort of doubtful. So Green New Deal really sort of says, hey, we got to go accelerate this process, and 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 really not, and even Greta Thunberg and all are now arguing that hey, no net zero, we need to get to absolute zero by 2050, not net zero. And so Green New Deal really has to be seen as a absolute zero program by 2050, not a net zero by 2050. And it requires massive infusion of capital. So you have to see Green New Deal, which is primarily a US sort of, you know, you know, democratic socialist demand. I don't think there are equivalents of Green New Deal in Europe and other parts of the world. But if you look at Green New Deal, it has to be seen in, it's, it's a jobs program. It's a program to reconstruct US infrastructure. And it has to be seen in a larger perspective of demand around defund the police, Medicare for all, free college, living wage for all, or you know, student debt forgiveness. I mean, it is a whole cluster of demands of which Green New Deal is one. And I certainly think that there is a lot of issues with Green New Deal, which we need to, as, as communists, we need to talk and we need to come up with alternative formulations well and beyond Green New Deal. And so these policy things need to be studied and critiqued by us. I that was very good. That Sandy. documentary, that documentary, the name I posted it, but I'll tell you, is called "Taken for a Ride." Yeah, taken Thank you. for a ride. It's available on the internet. All right. Uh, so it's one o'clock now, and uh, thank you very much, everybody, for participating, and thank you, Raj, for a great uh, presentation. Very thought-provoking, and everybody who participated in this. So. Hope to see you next week. Uh, thank you, everybody. Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Prompt Amongst Library receives no corporate funding. 
nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday S U N D A Y at yahoo.com and the name is Richard Fallenbaum and checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F A L L E N B A U M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Nebro Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California 94609, or di directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml info for information write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org